Our next spanel, panelist, not spamalist, our next panelist will be Scott Howe. Scott has degrees from the University of Utah, University of Michigan, and the University of Hong Kong. I've heard he's planning on getting some more. Scott is a registered architect in California and Oregon with five years practice with BWLC Architects in Rancho Cucamonga, California. Did I pronounce that right? Cucamonga? And 10 years practice with Kajima Corporation? Kajima Corporation, thank you, in Tokyo, Japan. He spent three years as an assistant professor at University of Oregon and six years as an assistant professor at Hong Kong University. He is currently a senior systems engineer at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where he is a member of the Constellation Architecture Team for the lunar outpost that will be constructed in 2020. His projects and publications can be viewed on his website, which is at plugin-creations.com slash US slash ASH. If you want that URL, you can also get it on the website over there. Scott will be presenting to us his fascinating ideas on quantifying morality, or basically the beginnings of an attempt to objectify moral decisions. Scott. There's this, uh, there's this very interesting phenomenon in, in our house where uh, if I take uh, stuff and throw it on the floor, papers, bottles, you know, whatever, after I get done with drinking some water or whatever, I throw it on the floor, um, somehow it disappears and it's, you know, the floor is clean and stuff like that. And I, I just, I kind of wonder, you know, is there, is there this uh, de-entropy device in our house or whatever? And, uh, well, after a few days in the doghouse, I realized that uh, the de-entropy device, she's sitting right up there. <laughs> But anyway, this kind of introduces uh, the, uh, the thought of uh, some of the things that I've been thinking of um, as I've been uh, working with uh, uh, assembling uh, structures, self-assembling structures, et cetera, using robotics. Is there a way to uh, determine objective value in various you know, configurations and different things like that, the order that you come out of that? And, it naturally, as an LDS, it kind of led into a, uh, an idea that, you know, somehow my theology links to every other aspect of my life, which I'm sure every engineer here is able to say the same thing. And, um, you know, we find it as one continuous continuum that there must be some kind of a link between order and opportunity and that uh, maybe in all of this there might be something that will help to come up with a theory of the atonement. Now, if we, are, if we indeed believe that God is an engineer and that the atonement is the most important aspect of, the, of our religion, then there must be a set of laws, there must be a set of rules or whatever that, that uh, he uses that if there was an atonement, as, uh, as I believe uh, Givens was, or was it somebody else that was talking about how the... Uh, if there was an atonement, then God would cease to be God. I guess that was this morning. Yeah, okay. And uh, so if, if he did follow that law, then the atonement must be necessary through a series of, of these natural laws. And that's kind of what I've, I've just, it's my holy grail. That's what I'm after. So uh, in this, I'm just kind of, I, I'm putting together some ideas as a, a first attempt at setting a groundwork for a discussion. And none of the things that, I, that I've been going through, of course, are, are, I claim that are absolute, but there's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's for a discussion as a theoretical approach that perhaps there's a way of quantifying moral choices that will eventually lead to something that we might be able to call a theory for the atonement, which is not the subject of this paper, but eventually I hope to attack, tackle that someday. The other thing is uh, the things that I'm going to tell you about, it's not a, a tool for real-time evaluation. If you're right there about ready to commit a sin, you, you can't use these things to say, well, should I do it or should I not? It's rather something that's uh, it's kind of a way for um, thinking about you know, what, what uh, 
if there is a quantifiable way and if we can put value to it so that there's a way of communicating on an objective basis. So uh, I'm going to talk about these various topics. Uh, the proliferation of opportunities, cause and effect, entropy and sin, and is there a possible mathematics for morality? So uh, the, uh, the se typical se secular way of uh, determining whether it's uh, moral or not is by saying, uh, asking, you know, does it hurt anybody else? The problem with this, of course, is that it, uh, inclu that includes sins of commission, but it's, it does not um, include sins of omission. And uh, I've got a scale here on the bottom of the screen that talks, that shows uh, kind of a, uh, uh, a spectrum where at one end we are buffeted about by every wind of change and uh, circumstance is the master of us. On the other end, we are, have slowly been able to master our environment and we have control over all circumstance. And what I hope to be able to get to the point of saying is that as we follow moral choices that we will get to the point where we're all the way at the right end of the spectrum and that we have control over circumstance and eventually get to the point where we, um, there's no unknowns and we have achieved godhood. So. The first thing I just want to talk about real quick is a proliferation of opportunities. If we use, instead of the question, will this hurt anybody, if we instead say, will this decision, will this choice that I'm about to make provide additional choices later on? Will it proliferate my opportunities later? So um, in, the, uh, in the paper that eventually you could read, I have this little um, uh, example of a person about to, they, they walk up to a cliff and they have three choices. One choice is they can turn around, walk back, and they have, they can go back to the cliff another day. You know, they have plenty of other choices that they can do. The second choice is they can climb down the cliff. And I'll explain some issues with that. The third choice is they can jump off, okay? And if you look at the, uh, the, the um, chart here, I've, I've created a decision tree that has depths of nodes that uh, we can, um, if, if we literally knew all the decisions that were gonna be made, we can count those and we can actually create a value system based on how deep the, the uh, decision tree is on how many nodes there are. Uh, in, uh, in option A, of course, it just proliferates. There's lots of choices that, that turn out. In option B, uh, if you haven't prepared yourself, you could get yourself into a situation where you do not have control over all, cons all circumstances in your environment, and you might end up having the same end as you would have if you chose C. You, the, the only choice left is to jump off, okay? So it, in, uh, in B, then, uh, the choice that it, um, if you chose B, then you would obviously want to prepare yourself in advance with ropes and all kinds of, of, of whatever to make sure that all of your choices are continually proliferated as you go along. So the, uh, as, you, as you start to expand your opportunities, you realize that some of the opportunities that are in the future end in red X's, okay? And so you want to be able to constrain yourself to the ones that advance your opportunities in the future. And uh, so in our, in our life, we live by definition in a constrained free environment. And by definition, what I mean by that is our, our bodies literally, in order to survive, we have, uh, if we, we're breathing air, uh, the air, in order to get to all of the cells that are possible, you, it's constrained in a certain route that goes through the body in order to get, you know, to the, the, get all the oxygen to get to each of the cells. So the very physics and the biology of our bodies uh, is a characterized, of, uh, characterized constraint. So I'm gonna keep going because I think uh, that's just the, 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 the very basic uh, front end of what I wanted to say. Um, that everything else is gonna build on um, and 
one of the big uh, connections that I want to make is that uh, in cause and effect, the uh, physics of the universe where um, a, a, an effect follows the cause, we can uh, also look at that as action and consequence. Um, and when we talk about uh, how justice in the scriptures, how justice must be satisfied, then uh, the, uh, the, the very same thing that, or, or the, this, this justice that we're talking about is literally the cause and effect that we see in the physical universe. The, uh, this cause and effect is the basis of all structure in the universe, where without cause and effect, you do not have forces or paths of forces. You do not have um, constraints that, that, are, that you're able to build upon and slowly build up structure and uh, that eventually uh, snowball into what we um, find ourselves at, at, in a position of advanced intelligence um, in complex bodies. So um, one of the questions that I, that I want everybody to think as I continue with my presentation is, is God's ultimate purpose to fight entropy? And the reason that I ask this is because by, in a lot of indications, we see that the universe is winding down. The, uh, the direction of time is such that as things go forward in time, they decay. And the, uh, if, if everything goes according to the, the um, path of entropy, then eventually we will have a couple of very nasty endings at the end. One is either uh, the, a big crunch, or the other one is a, uh, the, uh, um, what's the term for it? Cooling off or heat death. Yeah, heat death. And so in all of that, it's, it's, it's the ultimate demise of the universe that um, is a result of uh, entropy. And so if we consider um, what cause and effect is, we see that it's, it's something that uh, with a certain cause, it creates a kind of a ripple effect where this, this ripple effect just goes through and it, and it expands forever and ever or whenever there's, it, it'll, it'll go until it's blocked. If the, uh, one thing that we know is that uh, cause and effect can be channeled with structure such that uh, if, we, if we are able to create some kind of a structural barrier, then the cause and effect will bounce against it and, and, uh, and we're able to create structure that actually channels actions and things like that. In other words, we're able to manipulate the, uh, the matter of uh, using certain types of structures. So as an alternative definition of entropy, I'm going to kind of explain because uh, um, a lot of people might not know what entropy is. Entropy is a kind of a leaking of cause and effect, where you have a, a specific line of effects that, you, that you're creating in your, um, in your creation. And the, uh, if those effects get out away from what you're intending it to be, then it's kind of a leak. And um, another definition of entropy is it's a measure of disorder, where it's the number of unknowns in an, ar an arrangement. If you look at this diagram that I show, the, uh, it shows a bunch of particles that uh, can, or they're just randomly scattered on the page. And I'm showing the one uh, particle here in the middle, if you can see the cursor, that is, uh, has uh, a relationship with every other particle in the, in the whole arrangement, but since they're not connected, they're not physically connected, all those uh, relationships are unknown. And therefore, it's kind of a maximal uh, entropy situation. What this, product particle, or what this diagram shows is the single particle has all these relationships, but over here on the right-hand side, you can also take every single other particle and look at the relationship it has with every single other particle as well. And so a, maximal, a maximum entropy um, situation is where all particles are completely loose from each other and all uh, relationships are unknown. So uh, another uh, thing that is important about entropy is that uh, reversible processes uh, have low or zero entropy, 
where if you can take the process and if you, if you go forward a series of steps, one, two, three, and you can exactly and perfectly back out of it, three, two, one, then you've completely, you've recovered yourself. You, you haven't added entropy to the, to the universe. And uh, the last point I want to make about entropy is that entropy can be calculated. It, um, normally, it's, a, it's a, a kind of a probability because of the, the sheer number of particles. But there is a calculation that you can do to um, you know, discover uh, what, uh, what a, the value of entropy is for a certain arrangement of particles or for a certain arrangement of, of objects. The, uh, we can lower the level. Of, let me just, before I explain this slide, entropy then expresses itself in the universe in uh, decay where you see, like for instance, rust. Rust is an example of how the particles of the steel are starting to um, oxidize with um, uh, oxygen in the, in the atmosphere, and then slowly the, the pieces, they break away from the, the main body. And so slowly, you know, rust or uh, decay and things like that are just the, the, the typical thing where um, the energy is starting to leak, or the, uh, the cause and effect that is contained in this object is leaking out. Um, and and I'm, I'm specifically using these simplistic terms in, in a different way of, of describing how entropy um, functions. Um, so in this slide right here, a stable object has the, the lines of cause and effect completely self-contained. And the, uh, it's, it's stable because there, there is a, the, um, the cause and effect is not leaking out to the, to the universe. We can uh, lower the uh, entropy of an object or, or of a series of objects by bringing them together and connecting them together. And, the, and what this does is it reduces the number of unknowns between the objects and it um, also makes it easy to be managed. So if you, if you think about uh, reducing entropy as managing your uh, s series of um, elements, then uh, in this diagram here it shows how normally in a, in a maximum uh, entropy environment all these particles are related to each other somehow and we have to somehow keep track of them all and they're all unknown and it's just a scattering of, of uh, gravel all over the place, that's really hard to, to manage, whereas if we take them and, and glue them together in the chunks, you can pick this rock up and throw it, okay? It's, it's easy to manage. And what this uh, is showing is that the unknowns in, a, in, um, in the, the two or, uh, orange circles you see here have been reduced to just one because we have two groups that have been brought together and they've been organized and it's much easier to manage that way. Now, up in the right-hand corner, I have a, a diagram of Lego. Lego is, is a, a, a good example of this, where um, the particles that are in the Lego have been formed together in such a way that you constrain the number of ways that each Lego block can act with each other. Um, if you have just a jumble of Lego in a pile, the entropy is maximized. But once you start to fi fi fix those together, there's a, a fixed number of ways that you can put that together. The unknowns are reduced, and you have more um, prediction of what you can build. And, and this kind of constraint for future opportunities, then, is um, under our, under our control, because we, we, the constraint actually defines ways that we can start to organize. So in this case right here, this is showing a maximal entropy environment where all these parts, this is the, all the parts that are required to make this automobile, but there are, there's a, they're not connected anyway. The, there's the relationship, it's a big mess, okay? It's, there's a, we, there's no definition of what goes where and what connects to what, but once you put all these things together, then you've encapsulated potential. And everybody knows what the potential of a vehicle is. The potential is the ability to transport 
to carry things, et cetera. So with this potential that's encapsulated out of what could be potentially a high entropy, chaotic set of parts, we have developed something that's useful that will, can be a tool for, for continuing to reduce entropy. Um, so with this um, aspect, I'm, or with this uh, argument then, I'm going to introduce a, uh, a new definition for engineering. Um, considering that engineering is anticipatory. In other words, it is not completely causal. There is something that's ahead in the future that through our intelligence we are able to foresee and we're able to apply backwards and say, well, let's incorporate this potential into our structure and then this structure will be able to anticipate any uh, various types of cause and effect to be able to funnel that cause and effect in the direction that we want. And so my definition of engineering is the conscious buildup of potential to direct and influence cause and effect for the purpose of reducing entropy. And uh, to, to uh, re-explain that into, into English, I guess, it's, it's the, uh, the conscious uh, buildup of, <laughs> how can I, I, I can't reduce this any, anymore, but I guess it's the, <laughs> I guess it's the, it's a, Essentially, it's, it's, it's building order into the environment, okay? So the, it's engineering is building order in the, into the environment to enable opportunity. It's to, enable, it's to give potential or opportunity to whatever you are, you are uh, trying to create. So when we look at nature, we look at the universe, we see that uh, there's, there's an innate um, structure, there's an innate uh, order to it. Um, these, these atoms, they run on electromagnetic energy. Um, you can build anything with them. Uh, there's, a, there's a picture of an asteroid in the lower left-hand corner that is um, a, uh, it's, it represents a vast reduction in entropy. If you, if you consider, if that asteroid was just a bunch of atoms that's just scattered throughout space, entropy would be phenomenal, but if you gather all those atoms together into a rock, the, the entropy is vastly decreased. But the problem is, is that there is no potential, or there's very little potential for, for uh, continuing or for, for working. And so there's this, uh, this special arrangement of, of uh, atoms into molecules that, uh, that we've come to know as the DNA that runs, that encapsulates potential to manipulate the environment through these uh, self, uh, self uh, replicating structures. And these self replicating structures are literally microscopic factories that are able to build copies of themselves and also function and have a potential to manipulate the environment. Okay, so with this potential, then uh, suddenly we find that the enclosed, encapsulated cause and effect that's just working itself inside through cycles and cycles and cycles inside the cell, somehow it, it uh, creates a situation of negative entropy. We've actually gone the other way around and it's so ordered that it's negative entropy. The, uh, the complexity and potential is all encapsulated for, for number one, sensing the environment, and for number two, actuating and manipulating the environment. And number three, and this is the granddaddy of all, self-reproduction. Now what does self-reproduction do for us? Self-reproduction, it, it allows you to only, you could just create a few of these, let them go, let them reproduce, and suddenly they automatically just start to take all the chaos of the universe and order everything for you. It's all remote control, or not even remote control, it's all self-contained, it, it does it for you, for you. So 
thinking along those lines then, um, how does this uh, fit in with entropy? Uh, we have the, each individual organism, um, it, it breathes in something and poops out something else. And uh, is that really, I mean, is it, you know, it poops out things, you know, isn't that entropy? Well, what the issue that we have is, is that we have this, uh, this biosphere division of labor where whatever one thing poops out, something else likes it, okay? They're gonna take that, that's their fuel. And so the whole biosphere then becomes an incredible superorganism that has extremely minimized entropy. There's extreme high order in the biosphere because of the division of labor that's in there. And what's more, all the processes are, almost all the processes are reversible. So if we look at this one, the big fish is going to eat the smaller fish, which is going to eat the smaller one, all the way to the smallest organism, which ends up being a microscopic organism that will end up consuming the, uh, the body of the big fish as it decays. Okay, so we have organisms that are in the, bi in the biosphere that, in the division of labor that takes care of all the messes that happens um, due to decay and stuff like that and keeps that entropy, entropy at a minimum. So when we think about a mathematics for morality, um, transgression increases entropy. And, and uh, in one way that it does that is sin decreases potential opportunities, okay? The effects of sin can be calculated based on the uh, calculations of entropy. Repentance, restitution, reverses the damage and lowers ent entropy. So we're, if we could go backwards, then uh, we're able to pull out it, the process that we go forward. If, if we make a mess, if we're able to back out and completely restore that, then we're able to um, you know, if, avoid making a mess, but clean it up if you do. Okay, try, try to clean up after yourself. So, uh, the, uh, I, I've, I've, in the paper, that if you eventually get a hold of that, then I've taken actually each one of these items that are in here and I'm talking about how entropy can define the value or the less, or, or the unvalue of these various acts, such as a creative act, having a baby. If you just think about having a baby, what, ki what kind of entropy does that produce? Well, it doesn't. It, it, it vastly decreases entropy because you've created another self-replicating -repli seat for intelligence that is able to go on and exponentially re um, reproduce itself as well. Whereas if you take a life, the entropy that you produce is you First of all, you cut off that person's potential of eventually replicating or whatever, and uh, you end up, uh, you know, all, all the vast um, entropy of all of the little particles that make up that body, you've just increased the universe by that much entropy. Okay, so, and there's unconventional cases as well, um, such as building a house. Um, if you uh, build a house with, um, with materials that you have to destroy later, as opposed to if you build a house with things that you can easily unbolt and recycle. There's all kinds of things that, that come into green technologies and things that we kind of intuitively think are, uh, are, are true, but, but we don't really have a way of, of putting it into our moral system until now. So in conclusion then, um, is God's purpose to defeat entropy? If we think about the ultimate goal of eternal life, eternal life is continuation of the lives or self-reproduction. And so this ultimate goal and, and this, this eternal principle is available in every step of, of uh, the creation in, of self-replication or self-reproduction uh, to, to uh, reduce entropy. Um, and since I'm out of zero time, I'm not gonna explain this. But uh, what we wanna do is we wanna get all the way to the far right of the uh, of this column where we're in control of all circumstance and I want to leave one last tidbit for you to think on is the atonement non-causal and I'm not going to answer that but I might try to tackle it in a future paper thank you